Up next, our keynote presentation, Road to Resilience. Susan is a nationally known speaker, writer, and consultant with a heart for children and families. Her presentation, Road to Resilience, will outline the tools and skills needed to achieve resilience, including tips for getting started, building strong support systems, and dealing with setbacks along the road. Please join me in welcoming Susan to Real Voices, Real Choices. I'm really excited and happy to be with you here today for the Real Voices, Real Choices conference. And I'm here to talk to you about freedom and resilience through connection, hope, support, and advocacy. We need all of those ingredients to really ensure that ourselves and our children and our family members and loved ones can all find both the freedom to live the lives that they choose to live, as well as the resilience to bounce back from any kinds of stress, trauma, or other difficulties that we and they face. I've been on lots of road trips. I don't know about you if you've ever been on road trips, but um, we've taken our family on road trips. So I'm gonna use themes related to going on a road trip to convey the messages that I wanna share with you today. If you think about going on a road trip and how that compares to the road to freedom and resilience, what do we do for a road trip? Well, first we, we collect brochures. We look at the destination that we have in mind and we, we kind of dream about it and we salivate over those beautiful pictures. And that's part of what the road to freedom and resilience takes is having a vision and a sense of hope that we can actually do this. Then we have to sort of look at our vehicle. Maybe it's kind of been sitting in the winter. We haven't used it lately, or we just used it around town, haven't been on a long trip. So we got to get it tinkered with, get it tuned up, get, make sure it's really well oiled and ready to go. And that's part of what the whole recovery process is. Recovery from trauma, recovery from any other form of addiction or other challenges that we might face. As we get ready to hit the road, of course, we got to make sure we have gas in the tank and it's not enough just to put gas in the tank when we first start out. We have to keep making sure that we put in gas again and again before we run out along the side of the road. And that translates for us in our theme today into making sure we take care of ourselves along the journey. And not just that we sort of do some self-care right before we launch out, but that we continually replenish our own tank. Next, we need those signposts along the road, right? I mean, when you're traveling, you need those uh, speed uh, mile an hour signs, you need those destination signs, how many miles to the next exit, where's the rest area. And in the same way in our own life journey, we need those signposts that help remind us, when do we need a break? When do we need some rest? How, where is the next resource that might be valuable for us? What is the next clue that maybe we're getting a little overwrought, overstressed, and we need a little time out or a little extra fill up at a, at a food station or something? We also need the guardrails, right? When you're traveling on a road, especially if it's at night, you know, you need those guardrails that help keep you on the road. And even if you're the kind of person that kind of likes to explore, uh, back roads and, and places that other people might not always go, you still need to know where's the boundary, where's the edge. You need that kind of guardrail support. And so part of what our journey requires and our journey for our children is how do we ensure that even though we're trying to have freedom and we're trying to travel along the road after our own hopes and dreams, we also need the supports that will make that possible and healthy. Now I talked a minute ago about if you like to go on the back roads, I do, I like those back roads. I'm in Vermont right now, which is where I'm coming to you from for this, uh, this conference. And I loved traveling those dirt roads and those back roads, but there's other days when I like to be on a highway and just make time. And that's what we want for ourselves and for all individuals and our loved ones, our family that have any kind of life challenges. We want them to have both empowerment and the information they need so they can really make choices. Today, is this the day for the back road or the highway? What's gonna fit my journey today? As you're traveling along and you need to get from one place to another, sometimes you need that bridge that's gonna link you. I, I, I'm in Vermont now, but I live uh, most of the time in Philadelphia and there's a lot of bridges around there that connect us to New Jersey and other places. And we can often see right across the bridge to where we wanna go, that aquarium in Camden, New Jersey, for example, but we can't get there without the bridge. 
And in our life, our road, our journey towards resilience and freedom, those bridges are those connections, those important relational connections that we can have all the gas in our tank and all the signposts and everything else. But if we don't have relationships and connections, we're really not going to get very far. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a road where you see this big mountain looming in front of you in Pennsylvania. That happens a lot if you're heading from Philly to Pittsburgh. But wherever you live, uh, there might be those kind of places where you see this mountain and you think, how? How am I ever going to conquer that? How am I ever going to get through that? And then you realize that the engineers have built a tunnel. Sometimes that's what we need in this road to resilience is are those there are those special ways that we can get through the hardest, most challenging, most difficult parts of our journey. And then finally, I would never leave home without my AAA card. In fact, you're going to see a picture of uh, the one my husband and I use in a few minutes. That's what we need if unexpected things come up where we need help, we need support, we need tools right then and there. And so that's what I call the AAA club for our journey is the advocacy piece. We need our fellow advocates our network, the ones who can come and be there and be our champions, be our heroes, be our guides when we need them most, when we have that, that flat tire or that dead battery. So this is kind of my quick list of what this road requires. And now I'm gonna go into it in a little more detail. But before I do, I wanna take a little step back and share a little, uh, a little story with you. You may have heard this one before. Uh, it's, not, it's not in the road trip uh, theme, but it, it's about building and it's about getting to a destination that you wanna get to. Imagine you were going along on a road trip, uh, but this was just a big open road in the seemingly the middle of nowhere that there was no sign of human activity at all until in the distance you saw some workers doing something with bricks like these. And as you approach, you might be confused. What are they doing? What are all these bricks about? And so you might come to that first worker that you see and you might tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, what's going on here? We're in the middle of nowhere. What are you guys doing with these, these bricks? And that first worker might just be a little annoyed that you interrupted him and he might just kind of look up at you and say, well, duh, we're laying bricks, can't you see? And of course you could see that, but it doesn't really help you understand why are they there? Or what are they doing? And so you go to the next worker that you can see and, and you tap the next worker on the shoulder and he's laying brick upon brick and, and it looks like he's building a wall and, and you ask him, excuse me, could you tell me what you're doing here? And he's a little kinder, a little nicer, takes a moment with you and shows you, yeah, we're building a wall. And, and look, every single brick I put into this wall is really important. It has to be even, it has to be level. This wall has to stand up the test of time and, and when storms come through. So my work here is really important. I need to get back to it. And so now you have a little better idea of what's going on, but you still don't really know why, why are they building a brick wall in what seems like the middle of nowhere. So you go a little further and you ask the next worker, excuse me, can you tell me what's happening here? And the next worker stops working and just looks up so excited and says, yes, we are building a cathedral. And it is going to be the most amazing cathedral ever. It's going to reach high into the sky. It's going to be broad. This music is going to come through it. It's going to be amazing. And it's going to take so long to build that I may not even ever get to see it completed. But I know that every brick I'm laying is going to be part of that cathedral in the end. I know I'm laying down a legacy for my children and my grandchildren. And whenever they see this cathedral in the future, they will know I had a part of it. And so now you think, yeah, that, that's exciting. That's hope. That's vision. That makes sense. You know, that's kind of how this journey is going to be on this road to freedom and resilience for us or us with our children. There are going to be some days when it's all we can do to just sort of say, I'm laying bricks, can't you see? 
just every little activity, every phone call, every piece of paperwork, every effort to make a meal or get out the door for a meeting, it's going to seem like just one more brick, one more brick, one more brick. And then there will be some days when we do our advocacy, we do our teamwork with others, we partner with our support networks, and we see that they kind of do fit together and that it is forming a, a wall of resilience and we're building some strength that's going to get us through to the next day. And so, so we feel a little more encouraged. But we really get to that point of hope and freedom and resilience when we're able to envision, you know what, it's not even about the bricks, it's not even about the wall, it's about this cathedral that I'm building that's just going to be so great. And even if I don't live to see the end of the story of my children, my grandchildren, of the life that I've built through my efforts at resilience, I know that I've contributed to it. And that's kind of the vision we got to keep in mind as we're going on this trip. Now, you might wonder why I use this particular picture to illustrate the part about a cathedral. It certainly doesn't look like the types of cathedrals you may have seen in, in uh, Europe or in, in pictures about cathedrals. But this particular one uh, I came across in Kenya when I was there. And I especially use, even the bricks and the wall were from there, I especially use this because the people building it were so proud of their work so excited for what this was going to mean for the community. And there was such depth of poverty and so much trauma in that area. And yet they had the vision and the hope and they kept on building brick by brick, day by day. And so I wanna bring you that sense of hope and resilience from the people of Kenya, from the people of my own family and for each of you listening that we can have that same kind of enthusiasm and excitement as we build our own cathedrals. But before we can do that, we have to take a step before we think about all the signposts and other things we need on this trip. And we have to ask ourselves a question. Do we really value every person? Do we value ourselves? Do we value every person who has a mental health diagnosis? Do we value every person who's been through trauma? And to help us really think about this, I wanna do a little demonstration. I'm holding something up for you here. Hopefully you can see that it's a $20 bill and it's a nice crispy one. It would fit in a vending machine. You could park your car with it. And so if I was able to sort of pass it through this computer lens and send it on to you, I bet if I asked who would want it, all of your hands would go up. Everyone would love this nice, crispy, fresh $20 bill. But what if I made it seem a little less desirable? What if I crumbled it up like this? Would you still want it? It can't fit into the vending machine anymore. It's all crumply. But I bet a lot of you would still want it. So, so then I would take it further. I'd ask you, well, what if I dropped it on the ground? What if I stomped on it with my dirty shoes? What if I even spit on it? What if I even tore it? as I picked it up. Now, if it was a spit on, dirty, stomped on, ripped up $20 bill. You know, if you saw it on the side of the road, you might not even know that's what it was. You might think it was a piece of debris. You might walk right by it. Would you still want it? And if your answer was yes, then the reason you might still want it is because, well, you know what? Even though it's got all those damages and problems, it still has its value. It doesn't still just have some value, it still has all of its value. And that's what we have to remember because sometimes when we see people who've been trampled by trauma in their life, who've been riddled by various kinds of mental health challenges and maybe haven't yet gotten the services and supports that they need, whether that's myself that I'm speaking of, my child, another loved one, or just a person in my community or a person that I serve in my work, sometimes we see people and they kind of look like this or we even see ourselves looking a little like this, like that piece of seeming trash that would get discarded and walked on by. And yet we have to understand 
that still doesn't just have some value. That person, whether they right now might be homeless, whether they right now might be seemingly not to make sense in their language, whether they right now might have behaviors that are challenging, they still have all their value. We still have all our value. So we won't even get on that road to freedom and resilience unless we remember to value ourselves and value everyone, no matter what kinds of traumas or challenges we're facing. On those road trips, you hear that a lot, right? But we also use that title as a metaphor for the idea that we're never really there yet. That life really is a journey and we're always on it. And so some of what I'm gonna share with you in my remaining time is what have I learned from those life journeys? On one of our journeys, our daughter Lily joined our family. That's her in the center there going up for the ball. She was a teenager who had been in foster care and she and her siblings had been through a lot. And so one of the first questions she asked me when she came to be part of our family was, how can I know that we can really trust you? And I started talking with her a lot about a lot of different things. Uh, and I basically said, you don't know yet that you can trust us, but I hope you'll learn that you can. And I said, even if you, you know, should happen to drop out of school or, or get addicted to drugs or, or do something that sends you to jail or anything you do, no matter what, will still always be your family, no matter what. And that's what all of us need. That's part of that road to resilience is making sure that every single person is connected to people that are in their life, no matter what, family and relationships are the foundation of our journey. Now for Lily, that began a journey that did lead to freedom and resilience for her. And she has a wonderful life now. And I'm actually here visiting her when I told you I'm here in Vermont. Uh, but for others, it can seem like roads don't lead to resilience. Roads with all kinds of IEP plans or treatment plans or inpatient plans or outpatient plans or transition plans, those, all those plans sometimes don't seem like they're gonna to lead to resilience or hope or freedom at all. Sometimes a lot of the roads that we are on or our kids are on seem like maybe it's the road to nowhere. This picture really exists. It's really a place in Georgia that I actually was one time. I was driving and trying to find a location where I was gonna be a speaker. And I got lost and I was driving around and I was lost and I was trying to follow the instructions on the GPS and I kept making wrong turns. And I ended up coming across this sign, nowhere road and nowhere lane. I literally was on the road to nowhere. Now, finally I did get straightened out and I got to where I needed to be. So I want to remind us, as one of the lessons that I've learned, is that not all roads will lead to resilience. Some quite literally will lead to nowhere. So if you find yourself on one of those roads to nowhere, do what I did in that situation, have persistence, get the right supports you need. I had called someone to help me out and figure out what to do. And then when you do that, even that road to nowhere can be the catalyst that gets you on the right road that leads to hope and freedom and resilience. Now let's back up a little bit to when I was a child. You see, my love of road trips started when I was a child and my parents would take us on road trips. But one of the road trips I didn't really love a whole lot was the trips to Detroit. I liked being there, we had relatives there, but I didn't like the trip because you see, the only way that my mom knew how to plan the trip was we needed to get to Detroit as quickly and safely as possible, but there was not going to be any fun along the way. No pit stops, no scenic routes, no stopping on the side of the road for a picnic. We were going to just pack what we needed and get going. I never really did enjoy those kind of trips, even though they worked, we got to Detroit hot and sweaty and kind of cranky and miserable. But I've had to learn over the years, there is another way to travel. And that's what I'm trying to share with you today. A way to travel that makes the journey just as important as the destination. And yet, it's important to keep that destination in mind. Now, even though my mom, she planned for the destination and not the journey, she did know that we needed stuff along the way. We needed snacks, we needed food, we needed tools. 
Now she didn't pack ice cream and some of those snacks pictured here, but she always did pack snacks that would get us there well nourished. She always made sure we had a toolkit. And in particular, she made sure our toolkit included jumper cables. I'm gonna come back to this part about the jumper cables a little later. But right here, I just wanna say, it's really important to always have the right kind of toolkit when you go on a trip. So that's the second lesson, planning in life, planning for resilience, planning for the dream and the future you want, including getting together the right tools that you need and then defining and keeping your eye on the destination like my mom did definitely helps you to get where you want to go. Fast forward again to the road trips we took with our kids. We outgrew that little camper as we added more kids to the family and we eventually started driving around in this big giant van. And you know, these kids in the van there, you can see their hands and everything. They're all excited because we took this picture when we were just ready to roll on a trip. We were saying, let's go. And that's one of the things I wanna share with you now is that sometimes, do you ever feel this way? Sometimes you can feel stuck in the planning stage, stuck in the treatment planning stage or stuck in the getting resources stage just not quite ready to actually take that next step. We're not going to get where we need to go in this life journey unless we're willing to take that first step. The most important part of the journey is to say, let's go, and then to get moving. Let's take action. We can't, we can't prepare for every possible breakdown or risk or challenge that might face us, but we can't be paralyzed by the fear that we don't yet have all the supplies and resources and supports. There's gotta come a time where we say, yes, we can keep planning as we go along, but for now, let's go, let's get moving, let's get started. Back to my childhood again. I'm sorry if I keep going back and forth, but I hope you're enjoying following the journey. This is an actual picture from a road my dad worked on. He was a highway engineer. That's his actual hard hat in the upper corner. And when I was little in the summer times when I didn't have school, he used to sometimes take me along with him uh, to visit his work sites. This was long before there was take your child to work day. And I would pepper him and ask him a lot of questions. And one of the questions I remember I asked him is, there's all these rocks in the way of where you're trying to put the road. How do you know where to put the road and he said something that has stuck with me ever since he said in order to plan your road you have to know two things where you are now and where you want to go where you are now and where you want to go and he even told me a story about this particular curve i had to look up in the archives to find the picture he said for example this part of the road is part of the southbound road but there's part of the curve here where for a minute travelers will be driving northbound because to get around that mountain we had to make the road curve and we had to kind of go in what seemed like the wrong direction for a few minutes to get back on the right direction. So as long as you know where you are and where you're going, sometimes your journey will take you on roads that curve. Sometimes you even have to be willing to maybe go sideways or backwards to get going forward again. And the reason I put his hard hat in there is because you know what? He wore his hard hat. He didn't wait and wear it after he already got hit on the head. He didn't wait and only wear it on a day when he thought it was high risk. He knew he had to wear it all the time. And in the same way on our road to resilience, we have to have our tools and our supports all the time. We can't wait until we're already in a crisis to say, oh, where's, where's that hard hat? Where's that tool? Where's that support I need? We have to have it always with us, be prepared for the potential of a crisis so that things that can be warded off and prevented don't turn into a crisis. And so just like with my father shared with us, I want to show you this little picture here to remind us that that freedom and resilience road isn't going to be a straight shot. If you look at from the first S over to the end here, the, the, the word spells success but it's not a straight shot, right? It's got lots of curves and hills and valleys along the way. So don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged even if it seems like sometimes you're kind of heading in the wrong direction, as long as you keep your eye where you're trying to go. I wanna tell you how that works with a real life person. 
This is my son, David. Now I'm going to take his picture off again for a moment and put us back to here while I tell you about him. You see, David was 13 when he joined our family, but he had been in foster care for many years and he had gotten a lot of labels put on him during those years. And a lot of the labels that were put on him had to do with his behavior and that he was uncooperative and non-compliant and difficult. And once when he was in a particular facility and the people who had read the file and understood all the challenges that he was labeled with realized there was a missing label. They said, you know what? I don't think he would be as challenging as he was if we tested his hearing. I think he's deaf or at least can't hear well. And that's why he doesn't respond to us when we talk to him. He was 10 years old before he was diagnosed with being deaf. Now, this didn't just happen because it was long ago. I actually hear cases like this every day or every few weeks. I get another story about a case like this even now. But I'm using his deafness also as a metaphor. You see, sometimes we look at the behavior. We look at the behavior, 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 and we don't see what's underlying it. As soon as we were able, as soon as people were able to see what was underlying his behavior, they were able to put the right kinds of tools and supports in place. And so this is him today. You know, he still has some lasting impacts from his trauma. He still has other diagnoses along the way. He's still deaf. But at the same time, he's a wonderful, accomplished, successful human being on his road to resilience and recovery, living his best life. It took someone being willing to step back and say, I'm not only going to look at the behavior, I'm going to look past it. I'm going to look under it. I'm going to try to understand what the real issue is so we can get the real kinds of supports that will best help him to reach his potential and his road to resilience. So those next two lessons that started with my dad and increased as I got to know my son, know where you are now. That means assessments of all kinds, clinical assessments, non-traditional assessments, cultural assessments to understand who is this person, the wholeness, the fullness of the person. And then be willing to go backwards or sideways if it helps you make progress towards your destination. Now, the, the next story I want to tell you about is about a young man named Jeremy. And Jeremy had been in a residential facility and things just weren't working really well. He was a teenager and, you know, we were having these team staffings and, and everyone was trying to find what's going to be the right combinations of meds or therapies or treatments for him and nothing seemed to be working. And we were having meeting after meeting after meeting. And one day we came together for a meeting and one of the people said, you know what, Jeremy really wants a job. He wants to be like other teenagers and have a part-time job. Can we set aside all the talk about meds and therapies and treatments for just this one meeting and brainstorm ways we might be able to help him get a job? Some people were appalled. They were like, that's not what we need to do. We need to focus. I'm here to tell you that sometimes the road to resilience and freedom requires detours. This seemed like a detour. It kind of was a detour. We were going off the main purpose of our meetings into a different, different territory. But Jeremy loved dogs and a job, a part -time job working for a dog groomer. And you know what? That job was the beginning of us also being able to fit the other pieces into place relationships and treatments and resources and services that started to build that road to resilience for Jeremy. So sometimes be willing to take those detours because sometimes it's not really a detour after all and it really does lead you to where you need to go. On a detour, what happens when you're, you're on your GPS, right? And you, uh, you take a wrong turn. It says recalculating, recalculating, or it goes and it shifts your direction again. So even when you're on a detour, keep in mind the destination you're trying to go to. Have that GPS set for the destination so that it'll kind of adjust with you as you go through those detours, just like this one is doing here. Keep your GPS locked in 
where it needs to be so that you really do focus on hope and relationships and just keep recalculating as often as you need to. Now, speaking of recalculating, sometimes we need major recalculations, right? Sometimes those detours are a little more serious. Like when a bridge that you needed to take to get where you wanted to go is truly flooded out like this one here. You might think, well, then I can't get it. But instead of thinking that, you have to think, what are all the other possibilities? I told you from Philly, there's a bridge that leads to the aquarium in New Jersey. And our kids love going there for birthday parties and other things. Now, if we saw this sign facing us just as we were about to get on the bridge to go to the aquarium, we could say, oh, too bad, no aquarium today. We could even go so far as to say, oh, too bad, no aquarium ever. I mean, look at the bridge is completely gone. But instead, we brainstorm. Well, maybe we can use a map or a GPS and find another bridge. Maybe we can come up with another activity that's just as fun as the aquarium. Maybe there's a tunnel under the road. Maybe we can hire a helicopter. There's all kinds of possibilities once you're willing to brainstorm. So even when you get faced with detours that seem daunting up, our work Rodney is a great example of that. You see, we were trying to plan for Rodney to actually be able to leave a residential facility that he was in, but Rodney had a challenge. He had this label as a fire setter. And so that made it hard for the family and the community to trust that he would be safe if he left this facility. We got a little creative and, and along with the usual clinical people that were part of Rodney's treatment team, we invited a local firefighter and some other local people to join the team to try to plan a safe transit to community for Rodney. And we started to think about all the things he was good at and that he loved. We started to think about the ways we could help him and those around him keep him safe from those fire setting challenges that he had had in the past. And by being creative, we were able to get Rodney out of that facility and back into the community and to this day fire. So barriers can, but sometimes it takes time. So we have to slow down and regroup when necessary. But when you see a barrier in your way, like that flooding, like that fire setting label, just don't stop. Slow down if you must, regroup, brainstorm, be creative, but never stop. Now, there was a time when I faced an even bigger challenge on a road trip than just a detour or delay. I actually was in an accident a bad one that looked like this. This isn't me, no one took a picture of my accident, but it was just like this. My car was completely flipped over in the dark of night. I was pinned in the car. I was terrified. I didn't know if I would ever get out or if anyone would ever find me because I was kind of in a ditch that I knew couldn't be seen too well from the road. A trucker eventually came along and he spotted me and he got out of his truck. He didn't just call in for help. He got out of his truck and he came down to help me. And then he realized he didn't have the right kind of tools to help me or the right kind of expertise. But you know what he did? He stayed with me. And he called for the right kind of help. He knew who to call. He had the kind of resources needed. And then he stayed with me. Now, years later, I still have a big scar on my arm from where I had to have metal plates put in and I had all kinds of other injuries. And that's because I had really good professionals that took care of me, doctors, nurses, all kinds of professionals. I am thankful every day that they existed. They're part of your road to resilience too. every professional that can help you heal and recover. But the most important person I remember from that situation is the trucker who stopped. I remember everything about him because he stopped even at risk to himself. What if my car had blown up? Even at inconvenience to himself, he got off track, off schedule with his job. Even when he knew he didn't have all the professional medical tools and skills to help me, he stopped and he stayed. And that's what it takes a lot of times on this road, real people. That's why I show you this drawing one of my children did. You know, she, she was asked to draw a picture of home 
in an early grade in grade school, but she put in it, the picture of home included people. We need real people, people who will be like that trucker and who will stop with us and who will stay with us and who will walk, walk on the journey with us. Because you see, I'm coming back to the toolkit, like I promised, I said I would tell you a bit more about the jumper cables. You see, if you're somewhere and your battery goes dead in your car, you can have all the knowledge and all the skills and all the tools you want, even this tool, even a jumper cable. But the jumper cable is not going to do you any good unless someone else comes along with a live battery that can connect to yours. So of all the knowledge and all the tools and all the skills that we need, the single most important one is connection, relationships. We need those trained professionals. Sometimes they even save our lives, but we also need those truckers who stop and stay. And then we need to make sure they're equipped with the right tools like the jumper cables to get us on our journey. Now, this is a situation, I'm gonna to try to play this little video for a second if you can see it. Watch what happens. This tree just gets wet and blows around. And even though it sounded a little different, they really were the same kind of storm with the same type of wind. So what makes the difference of a tree that can stand tall and strong in a storm or a tree that completely becomes uprooted, a strong root system, a strong root system. So part of what it takes to have resilience and freedom, the freedom to be that tree that can just flow and be flexible and maybe get a little wet in the storms of life, but not collapse, not get uprooted, is a strong root system. So that, that's part of what I mean when we said we need those truckers, we need those people on our journey. Because a lot of times what happens when there's mental health challenges in our life is that we're not like the tree that became completely uprooted, but we're also not like the tree that just kind of waved in the wind. We're more like this partially uprooted tree. We can't quite get the benefit of the nourishment of our roots. And we can in some ways become a danger to ourselves or others lying there across the road like that. And so we have to really put in place the nourishments and the extra resources and the extra supports to get that tree righted back up, reconnected to its roots, get the soil around it strong enough to hold it even in the worst of storms. Because we're never gonna be able to promise ourselves or anyone else that we can get through life with no more storms. There's always going to be another storm on the horizon, another trauma, another mental health crisis, another break of some kind, another stress, another anxiety. So we need those strong roots, those deep roots, those connections and supports that help us to, to stay strong even during the toughest storms. I love this African proverb, if you want to go fast, yeah, sure, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And that's what I'm talking about here for our road to resilience. And another way to say it is this quote by Brene Brown, we're hardwired to connect with others. It gives our lives purpose and meaning. And another way to say it is that triple A plan, like I mentioned to you at the beginning of my talk, we all need our human triple A plan for the tough times. So build that strong support system. So you can be strengthened and nourished and, and your roots will be strong enough to get you through even the hardest storms. Now I wanna take us back to that Detroit for a minute because I wanna tell you about another Detroit trip. And it kind of relates to that story you've probably all heard of about, you know, welcome to Holland where some, a person has a, a child with special needs and that she thought she was gonna be flying to Italy and she ends up landing in Holland. You know, when we when life hits us with extra challenges, trauma, mental health crisis, long term depression, anxiety, all the all the challenges we've had as a result of COVID. It's kind of like, you know, that story of Holland, we thought maybe we we're going to Italy, but we didn't even end up in Holland. We ended up in Detroit. Now, nothing against Detroit. I actually love it. Like I said, I have family there, but it's not usually on people's bucket list for travel. 
And yet one time I went there with one of my daughters and you know what, we had as grand a time in Detroit as we ever would have had in Holland because there's museums and there's good food and there's jazz music. You have to sometimes find it though. It's a little harder to find it maybe in Detroit than in Holland. But first you gotta look for it. And what it takes to get out of that mindset of, oh, I'm only in Detroit, I'm not in Holland, takes courage, takes courage. The courage of the one that was called the Cowardly Lion. The Cowardly Lion, who, if you remember this scene, right, he at first was so terrified, he was scared of his own tail, and then he owned his own courage, and he said, oh, I've got courage. And here are some of the things that are going on even right now in my own life that take courage for me to get through. Whether it's dealing with depression and mental illness in my family, whether it's dealing with physical and medical conditions, whether it's family members who are homeless, whether it's racism and racial inequality, whether it's incarceration, I'm dealing with all of those things in my own extended family. You may be dealing with some of those things and getting through all that, it takes courage. And it takes the kind of courage that I learned from my little grandson here. He's older now, but this little boy at the time, Daniel, we were going on a trip and there were some caves we were going to go explore. But as we stood at the top and looked down, they looked a little scary and I saw his eyes get big as saucers. And so I said, it's OK, Daniel, it's OK to be scared. And you know what he said back to me? He said, Nana. I'm not scared, I'm brave. And you can come with me and I'll hold your hand and we can be brave together. That's what the journey takes, being brave together. And being brave together means everyday brave. Yeah, it's one thing to be brave in the midst of big crisis, the car accidents, the suicide attempts, the hospitalizations, the fire setting child, all of those big crises require big amounts of brave. But there's a lot of bravery we need every day. You know when you're getting that 14th call from the school and it's only Tuesday? You know when you feel like your, your anxiety is just overcoming you and you can't get out of bed? You know when you feel like you just don't know if you can deal with that relative that, that is racist? Every day we face things that require us to be brave. And so we need courage not just for the big things, but every day. And you've noticed I've used some scenes from The Wizard of Oz, and I, I wanted to remind you that when people my age were young, we actually uh, only could watch it once a year when it came on TV. Now you can watch it anytime, Netflix, whatever. But when I would watch it when I was nine or 10 years old, I knew I could go to school next day and all my friends had watched it too. That was a sense of community. That was a sense of collective belonging being brave together. And so even though you may not have it with the Wizard of Oz anymore, click those ruby slippers and find ways to have that sense of we are together. We are together and we're together intergenerationally. So that road to freedom and resilience requires great courage and also lasting multi-generational connections like we saw in that wedding picture uh, of my son's wedding where there were people of all ages and stages of life. Courage and connections. And so the last thing I wanna say to you before I say thank you for listening is as you see in the upper corner here, the words that depict stress and anxiety, the more we focus on those things, actually we dig ruts in our brain neural pathways that create even more stress and anxiety. The more we can focus on this journey of hope, this journey towards freedom and resilience, using all the different little factors that I talked about along the way, the more we can even focus on a moment of gratitude every single day, the closer we'll get, even through the twists and turns, even through the sometimes going backwards, the closer we'll get to that vision of hope and resilience that we started our journey with. So on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for having you, having me as your keynote speaker today. I'm Sue Badeau, and I'm really excited to be with you. Have a question for our presenter. 
Submit questions in our video chat and the presenter will address as many as possible. I'm delighted to be here live with you all where I'm happy to answer questions. If you have some, I'm seeing the great thank you messages coming across and I really appreciate them. Uh, so thank you for for that gratitude. Gratitude does go a long way and I, and I love that, but I'm also here to answer your questions. So anything you'd like to ask in the next few minutes. I noticed several of you are saying that you found it helpful. If anyone wanted to type in the chat anything concrete specific that you might take with you, uh, that would be helpful. That would be great to see and to share. So I do see a question coming up that I'll be happy to give a response to. How do you push forward when you have a plan but difficulty taking action? That's a really great question because I tend to go all one way or all the other. Like I'm all in, just jumping in with two feet and not really planning well enough. Or um, when I have uh, that plan but can't quite take that first step. And either way, as I mentioned, the, the concept of having relationship and connection. If you have one person, and if you're a couple, um, you know, your spouse has a great connection, but I'm talking about even someone kind of outside your most inner circle, so that you have that connection, someone that'll encourage you, that'll motivate you, that'll remind you of your goals, uh, and that you can share what's holding me back right now. So it's really that other person that is the best resource I have for motivating me when I am feeling a little bit stuck. Uh, I see another question here that says, uh, what are the names of my books? So the book um, about our family journey is called, Are We There Yet? Um, Adopt, uh, the Ultimate Road Trip, Adopting and Raising 22 Children. And that's written by my husband, Hector, and myself. Um, I It's on our website it's also on amazon and then the book that deals with a lot of the trauma topics uh, and that has coloring pages but also trauma information is called building bridges of hope and it's a coloring workbook for adults um, and those caring for children who've experienced trauma there's a companion version called bubbles and butterflies that's specifically for children uh, let's see a couple other questions coming through um, my son, my son that I talked about, he's, uh, he works at a university, he has his own apartment, he has lots of friends, he follows sports teams, uh, he has a really, uh, great life. Sometimes when you're in the midst of severe trauma and grief, it's hard to remember hope and courage. Absolutely. And one of the things I like to do when I do these workshops in person, but I would encourage you to do for yourself, I actually have cutouts of that, um, that courage badge that the lion uh, received in the Wizard of Oz. And I ask someone else, that other person, my connection person, to write down for me uh, uh, some kind of words of advice or encouragement that will help me when I'm waning in my courage. And then I keep that little piece of paper, maybe in my wallet, maybe on a bulletin board, uh, maybe a photo of it right in my computer or my phone so I can look for it um, whenever I need that extra motivation, that extra encouragement to have courage. Um, what do you do when you discover that people you thought you could trust can't be trusted? How do you turn things around? Well, 
first of all, we have to really understand, you know, is this that this other person can't be trusted or are they tapping something in me that's painful? And so first kind of unpacking our own anger and hurt and seeing where it's coming from. And maybe we need a third party, a different person, not the one that we're worried about to kind of help guide us through that. Not in a gossipy, oh, let's vent, let's talk trash about this person way, but someone that'll help me really tune in and understand what's what's my challenge what's what's happening and then if you value this relationship and you want to keep it going definitely try to have that conversation with that person and um and be sure that you can you know say i i own some of this i recognize i feel this way or that way but um could we talk a little more about what it'll take to rebuild the trust connection between us and then, you know, if it doesn't happen, then you have to accept that this is not going to be your close trusting relationship. Maybe you'll still value that connection for other reasons. So you won't cut that person completely out of your life. But, you know, you'll find those other people in your network of support who will have to fulfill that particular role. Knowing that others have been challenged before me and getting through is an inspiration. And that's absolutely um, a great example, a great comment to add here. Um, how do you break through the wall that children in foster care have built up? Well, uh, first of all, you have to sort of not really think of it as a wall, but as a protective protection that their brain and their body and their emotions have through the trauma and through the loss and through the disconnection have created ways to protect themselves. I like to think of it as what would happen if a uh, cheetah is chasing a gazelle, you know, the gazelle has to protect itself from that cheetah. And it's not going to always wait every time if there's uh, a new cheetah in the background to see if it really is a cheetah. If it gets a whiff or a hint that there might be a cheetah, it's going to be off. And that's what children ha are dealing with. They have these survivor strategies that are just baked in. And so we have to just slowly build trust. We have to slowly show that we're there. We have to not personalize when they, you know, say, I hate you or some of those kind of things that sometimes get said. We have to dig below the behavior and try to understand what's behind it. Like I mentioned with our son who was deaf, we have to understand it that same way, even if it's not a physical uh, challenge that they have, but more trauma related. And just really kind of keep... Um, keep at it. It's really about keeping at it, about being there like that trucker, just being there and being there and being there. Let's see if I can see the next question. There's some good resources being offered. Foster care and adoption uh, coalition, uh, really um, good friends of mine. I think you're talking about um, the agency Lori Ross is the director of, and you are really lucky in Missouri to have that as a resource for foster and adoptive parents. They're one of the best in the nation. Excellent resource. Be prepared for the road when all have our label and people want to go a different way than you want to go. Um, so preparing isn't about necessarily convincing other people, but it is about sort of laying out the realities and the facts and making sure you have, like I said earlier, the right tools. So if it seems like other people are pushing you in a different direction, you have to really, you have to do your own homework. You have to really understand, well, what are the realities of why this path is the path I believe in that I want for me? You have to have your your information, your facts. You also have to have um, other people that, all right, find someone else that's going to support this journey. You take your time and you need to always listen. Listen to hear. Even people who seem that they want to go a different way than you, listen to understand what's behind it. Do they have fear? You know, sometimes it's parents or others that care about us that are worried about us and have fears. And we have to let them at least air those and talk about them and then, uh, kind of come back with our own research about why we think we can overcome those fears or those concerns or why we're not going to let them drag us down and debilitate us. Oh, well, I know Melanie Sheets as well. She's got two really great uh, organizations, both really helpful for families with um, foster care or adoption issues. So excellent resources. Thank you. Take advantage of your support system. Let's see, I'm just seeing. 
I missed any questions. I like that someone wrote, um, detours can be helpful. Absolutely, we have to be flexible enough. We have to be both consistent and flexible, consistent to stick with our plan, to not be easily discouraged, to not easily give up, but at the same time to be able to be flexible enough to take a detour and to not take it just always grudgingly. And, I just got to get through this. There is survival mode. We want to push past survival mode and be into what I call thrival mode. Um, kind of a made up word, but we want to work towards thriving uh, and post-traumatic growth, not just post-traumatic stress. And that, that is a, a real thing as well, post-traumatic growth and, and thriving and resilience. We want to always move towards that. And so when we do hit a detour, it's kind of taking it with gusto and embracing it and saying, what am I going to learn from this? How is this going to help me? right now. Another time to do that besides detours is also if you feel like some person or some agency or some service that you're getting is a repeat of something you've had before uh, or you don't really have anything to learn from, from this person or this resource. Instead, challenge yourself and say, okay, yeah, I've heard this before or this is old hat to me or 101 level, but why am I, why am I hearing it today? Why is someone, you know, why, why is the universe or my faith or whatever it is that kind of draws you there, why is someone making sure I hear this today? What is there today that even if this is a rerun or a, a revisiting or a refreshing of something I already knew, what is it today that I can glean from this? Or what value is there today in me sort of reflecting on this truth or this resource or this information? How will it help me in my journey today? So that's a challenge, just like the challenge of, um, of dealing with detours, the challenge of dealing with, you know, we seem to often have resources that seem too elementary or 101, or we've been there before, we've had this before, it doesn't really seem helpful. So can we figure out another way to look at that very situation and say, what can I get from this today that will benefit me today? Even if it is something I already knew before, maybe I haven't thought of it lately. Maybe I haven't thought of it in this context. So just like a detour, that's another way to, to, think, of, um, to think of something. Okay, there's a question there about the agenda from Jack that's I'm not the right person to answer. But I think I caught all the questions that were directed to me. If I missed one, please highlight it for me or restate it. Uh, and if you have another one, I think we still have a few more minutes. So please feel free to add another question if you have one. Barbara, I appreciate you mentioning that you found my books useful. Thank you for that. I remember you. I remember the day we met. Okay, I think my time with you all is winding down. So again, are there any other um, questions that I missed or anyone need any elaboration on anything? Sue, it is so great to have you with us this morning. I wish all of our Monday mornings could start this way. I think our weeks would just be absolutely incredible if we can start off every Monday morning with um, this, this type of motivation and this uh, encouragement to, to hang on to resilience. Um, I think I did see another question perhaps in the chat if you want to uh, take that to suggestions for moving past some deep hurt. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult and challenging question, but I do appreciate you raising it. Um, you know, the deeper the hurt, the longer it, it lasts with us and the, the deeper the scar eventually will be even when we have a scar. So we have to give ourselves grace and space. First of all, we shouldn't be pushing ourselves to 
so-called move past it, but rather to balance it with other things in our life. Uh, sometimes when I teach about this, I talk about, I show a picture of my granddaughter who's a gymnast on a balance beam. And if gymnasts, when they're on the balance beam, if they start to get off balance, they're very intentional about pulling themselves back in balance. So have your self-care tools, have whether it's a scent you like to breathe in, whether it's coloring, whether it's uh, meditation, whether it's a person you call. And when you start to feel yourself sort of getting, getting off balance because the deep hurt is overwhelming you or overtaking you, be intentional, intentional about pulling yourself back a little bit, but still giving grace and space to say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ignore that pain. I'm not gonna ignore that hurt but I'm going to do some things that are going to help bring me some balance. I'm not going to get stuck there. Another thing at nighttime, if those deep hurts keep you awake, something that actually can be helpful is writing it down, writing a worry down that you don't want to take to bed with you and literally putting it in a different room, not the room you sleep in. And just telling your mind and your body, I know, I know, I'll still have to deal with that tomorrow, but for tonight, it's not going to be in the room I sleep in. It's not going to invade my sleep. And sometimes just that little gesture is enough to help your mind say, okay, I'm not ignoring it. I'm not in denial. I know I have to deal with it. But for the next few hours, I'm going to get some rest. So hopefully you find those tips to be a little helpful. I love that concept. That's awesome to just put it in another room. It will be there tomorrow and you can deal with it with a fresh mind and fresh, uh, fresh spirit to move into a new day. I think Jack Dotson also had a, a question about um, uh, how to be a great mentor um, and, and how does that correlate with uh, some of the others that are, uh, that, that are surrounding you? Mentors play a really important role when done well. So I'm glad you asked the question about a great mentor. There's actually a lot of research about mentorship and some mentor programs can be more harmful than helpful. And here's the key. The mentor programs that are more harmful than helpful are when the mentor for a particular individual changes frequently, when the mentor doesn't stick around long and the, the child or adult has to have a new mentor every few months or every semester of school. Or, uh, that actually creates more opportunities for loss, for feeling abandoned, for grief, and almost obliterates the value of any contribution the mentor can make. So the most important uh, tip for being a great mentor is stick with it. Stick with it. Stick with the person assigned to you. Be there. Show up. Uh, and that is the way to be a great mentor. Now you can learn skills about how uh, communication skills and trauma responsive skills and resiliency building activities. And there's lots of good resources, books, videos, etc. for that. Um, but the single most important thing that makes the difference, even the research shows between a successful mentor program and one that's not, is if you stick with it and you be there and you show up. Great advice. We all need people that will stick with us through all the thick and thin of life, for sure. Absolutely. I'm seeing a lot of people also uh, uh, jumping in, talking about the the putting your the the uh, at night putting your uh, writing it down putting your uh, challenges down and, and setting them in another room uh, so I people are really um, grabbing on to that concept that's hitting home so thank and you I, for that I just add it's important to be in that other room not in it or tear it up and throw it away involve in things and burn and that's good sometimes for a particular purpose. But what I'm talking about, you won't trick your mind that way. Your mind will know, hey, even if you burn this, it's still, I still got to deal with it. Uh, but if you put it somewhere in another space, then you can have that um, reassurance that, yes, I'm not going to ignore it or deny it, but I, I just don't have to deal with it right now. So that's a different. Well, we've got about, it looks like just another minute or so remaining. Sue, anything else that you would like to leave us with today? Some some final remarks just to keep us rolling on this awesome uh, beginning to our week that you have helped us start. Well, the one thing I always like to share is start every day, not just a Monday, not just a conference day, but start every day asking yourself a few key questions. And one of them would be, 
kind of two-sided coin of who can I turn to if I need support today and who can I offer support to today? And if you think of that question, even before you roll out of bed in the morning and just run through your list of who is who are there, who's your natural supports, who can you turn to and who can you support, uh, that really builds resilience. It actually helps re-channel your brain neural pathways. It gives you a boost of sort of feeling good in your emotions and even your body. Uh, so if you start every day remembering I'm not alone and, and not only that, but I have supports, but I can also be a support. Um, then, then that's you puts you well on that road to resilience. Absolutely, thank you so much, Sue, for being with us and kicking off our Real Voices, Real Choices 2021 conference in such a, a exciting and powerful way, so that we're able to uh, really just cling to your words and uh, move forward with with full hearts of uh, courage and resiliency. So thank you so much for being with us today. We truly appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed being with you and thanks for all the great comments.